Hi everybody, it's Mr. Hamilton here. This video I'm going to talk about the inclined plane pulley problem. If you're in my class, I likely have this handout attached to our class Edsby page. Um, and you can print it off or you can write it down. If you're not in my class, I invite you to follow along, make your notes as you go, and to uh, learn a few things. This is a big problem that high schoolers are trying to wrap their minds around before they go off to university because first university, if you have a good handle on this, you're really well set in a lot of the areas of physics, uh, a lot of the classical physics. Uh, if you have a good understanding of forces and angles, it's a really key problem. So hopefully this is helpful for you. So the ideal so solution that we're going to look at here assumes that there's no um, moment of inertia calculation on the, the pulley itself. We're, we're assuming it's a frictionless pulley. We're, ass we're assuming that there's some friction acting on this block right here. Uh, and then we have a string that's not going to stretch. So the rope doesn't stretch, the pulley is frictionless, and the rope has no mass. So that's negligible mass on the rope. So that's what we're looking at in this situation. So the question says, given these information, so we've got the mass of 3 kilograms and 4 kilograms, we've got a coefficient of kinetic friction of 20 degrees, and we have an angle of inclination of 30 degrees, assuming that's two sig digs, we're going to make that assumption there. It says, find the acceleration of the system and find the magnitude of the force of tension in the rope. So let's go ahead and see how to do that. The first thing we note is that since one mass is moving at an angle and another straight down, the X and Y components aren't helpful. So what we want to do is instead we want to consider forward motion and break any vectors at an angle to this down into components. So we're going to, conf we're going to write that as these parallel lines as a subscript instead of an X and a Y. We're going to write those parallel lines. And then anything that's perpendicular to the forward motion will be written with the subscript that looks like a two perpendicular lines. So we're required to find the acceleration. And we want to draw free body diagrams. So recognizing that the whole system is going to accelerate forward, look at, like looking like that. Uh, if we draw the free body diagram of mass one, that's the hanging mass. Let's do that first because it's, it's the easiest one to analyze. The only forces we have acting on it are the force of gravity going downwards and the force of tension acting upwards. Because it's accelerating forwards, that force of gravity is going to be a little bit larger than the force of tension. And we're going to identify that the forward direction is positive, so that's downwards. Now let's analyze the second mass. And this is where things get a little bit more complicated, but it's something that we should be able to analyze based on what we've done previously, if we're familiar with any forces on angles. So the first thing is identifying, okay, well, if it's this is the block that's on the 30 degree slope, which means that the force of gravity is acting straight down and this angle here between the force of gravity straight down and the perpendicular force of gravity is 30 degrees. And then this parallel force of gravity, meaning that it's parallel to the direction of motion. Notice how we say it's FG2 parallel and the perpendicular one was FG2 perpendicular. That one is the opposite side of this right triangle. So we break that force of gravity on that second mass, the mass on the on the ramp into those two components. Now we also have this normal force that's acting perpendicular to the surface. So that's that force right there. Now we could label that with perpendicular, but we know it's perpendicular. Really the only things we need to be clear on perpendicular and parallel are the force of gravity that's perpendicular or parallel because there's two components, one that's acting perpendicular and one parallel. All of the other forces are acting either just perpendicularly or just parallel to the motion. So the normal force is perpendicular. We have this force of kinetic friction that's acting um, parallel to the motion and this tension force that's pulling the whole thing forward. So that tension force better be larger than the force of kinetic friction. Now you'll notice what I've done here with this dotted line is I've just brought this FG2 parallel up here so that we can see it being drawn on the actual uh, mass from the center of the mass. So that's not another force, it's just this force down here redrawn up here. So really what we're interested in is we're interested in this, in the forces I'm about to identify. This one, one, two, three, four, five. So there's five forces, if you will, four total, but the force of gravity is broken into two components. So we have five different things that we need to analyze. So if we look at the system free body diagram and we consider that down is forwards, that means that really the tension force is an internal force. So that's not drawn on the system free body diagram. 
So the force of gravity on the hanging mass is the only force that's acting to push the whole thing forwards, or pull the whole thing forwards, obviously. The only forces that are acting to oppose the motion are the force of gravity uh, of the second mass, the parallel portion of it, so Fg2 parallel, and the force of kinetic friction. Those are the only two forces acting to oppose the motion. Now, we also have these other forces, and if I move across here a little bit, you can see it better. Um, we also have the normal force and force of gravity to perpendicular, but those two forces are equal and opposite, so they're not in the direction of motion, and they're not actually accelerating the system. So we're really only drawing on the system free body diagram the three forces that are accelerating the system. So let's go ahead and see how we can calculate things with that. The first thing we want to do, calculation-wise, is we want to break up the force of gravity into its two components. So we actually have some type of mathematical representation for it. Now, if you wanted, uh, you could break these up and actually calculate these. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute them into the equation and calculate it all at once at the end. The first thing is the perpendicular portion of that second force of the uh, force of gravity on the second object on the, the mass on the, on the slope is Fg2 cosine of 30 because it's the adjacent side. If you need to go back to the other side and see, it's the adjacent side in that right triangle. Therefore, it's cosine of 30. And we know that the force of gravity on 2 is the mass times acceleration due to gravity. So Mg2, or M2g cosine of 30, and that's acting downwards. Now, the parallel portion, if the other one was cos, is going to be sine, and so that's acting backwards. Right? Because the F Fg2 parallel is acting backwards to pull it backwards like that. And then Fg2 perpendicular is acting down here. So it's down compared to the slope. So you'll notice, as I said, we didn't already solve for these. We're going to substitute them in and solve at the end. So how do we actually go about doing this? Well, we're going to use that system free body diagram. And we're going to solve the acceleration by using that. And so we start with the net force is the tension uh, total mass times acceleration. So it's for the system because it's a system free body diagram. And we then list those three forces that are acting to either cause the acceleration or oppose the acceleration. So the three forces that are acting parallel to the direction of motion. So the mu k, uh, so we know that the force of kinetic friction is equal to mu k fn, and it's acting backwards. So if you want, you could just put that as a negative value. And the same thing we know Fg2 parallel is also acting backwards. So we could put that in as a negative value. So I've shown here in square brackets, so just writing it as back, back. But if you wanted, you could just say negative and negative, and that would mean back. The force of gravity on the hanging mass is a positive force. So you could put that just in as positive and or forwards. And it's the mass times acceleration to gravity. So that's how we get M1g. So we have three, these three parts to this that equals the total mass times the acceleration. So we also know that this force, the normal force, is equal to the force of gravity on the uh, mass that's on, this, on the slope, the perpendicular portion of that, because we know that there's no acceleration of, the, of that box uh, away from the ramp or down into the ramp. And so Fn is equal to Fg2 perpendicular. And Fg2 perpendicular, we solved up above, that is the same thing as M2g cosine 30. So now we can say it's not only mu k f n, we know it's mu k m2 g cosine 30 backwards, and then we have the other things we already discussed. So now it's just a matter of rearranging for the acceleration, and the only thing we have to do is divide by the total mass, and then sub everything in. And it gets to be a pretty long, drawn-out uh, equation to sub things into, but the nice thing about subbing it all in at this step is that we can, and it might be helpful for some of you if you actually calculate each of these numbers as you go and then you can see oh that is contributing this much of the force and that is contributing this much of the force but the other th reason it's nice is to write it like this and substitute everything at this step is we're often going to have situations especially in first year university where they ask you to rearrange and show how one equation becomes another without actually solving for anything and that's just a way that they can ensure that you have done the work as opposed to some computer that you put numbers in and it calculated it for you
So we get, we sub the numbers in, notice our total mass is the combined mass of those two masses, and we get a total acceleration of 2.8 meters per second squared to two sig digs. As we already discussed that 30 degrees, we're assuming is two sig digs. So that's the first part of this question. That's how we find the acceleration. Now we go ahead and we say, well, how do we find the tension in the rope? Now we had two free body diagrams. I'm going to go back up here. And we had these two free body diagrams. Mass two is here, mass one is here. We could use either one of those free body diagrams to find the force of tension, but by far the simplest one is this mass one. And so we're gonna use the simplest one here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, again, have that free body diagram accessible and drawn again. And we're gonna then start with the net force is MA. Newton's second law always applies to every object, but we're now going to recognize that this is the free body diagram only for mass one, so it's not the total mass anymore. We break down the net force into the force of tension acting, uh, force of tension on that, plus the force of gravity, and then we substitute, rearrange and substitute in. We bring the force of gravity to the other side. We substitute the values in after breaking down the force of gravity to being m1 times g, and we find the force of tension to be negative 28.14 newtons forwards. And so what that means in terms of this particular question, it means the force of tension on the hanging mass is going to be negative forward, which is backwards, which should make sense because on the hanging mass, it's backwards, but the force of tension on the mass that's on the slope is going to be forwards. So that's why it always says for, find the magnitude of the force of tension because it depends what object we're talking about that determines the direction. So the magnitude of the force of tension is 28 newtons to two significant digits. So that's how you do those types of questions. And now it's your turn to try. So. But if you'd like, I can quickly show you one other alternate method for part A that might be helpful for some of you. You notice that what we had for part A when we broke down the system free body diagram, we had these three forces. And so I'm just showing you here that we could have calculated each of the forces, the numbers ahead of time. And so if we do those numbers ahead of time, what we end up getting is we end up finding that the force of kinetic friction is 5.0974. The force of gravity that's parallel, again, acting to oppose the motion, is 14.715 newtons. And then the force of gravity that's accelerating it is 39.24 newtons forwards. These two are acting backwards. This one is acting forwards and is bigger than the combined force of both of those, which it should be if it is, in fact, accelerating forwards. And so... Uh, we want to make sure that we're talking about everything in the same direction. So we let those two forces that are acting backwards be negative, And then we can add them all up, negative, negative, and a positive, And we get our same acceleration of 2.8 meters per second squared. So if that's more helpful for you to do it that way, you're welcome to do that. But like I said, sometimes in university or even in high school, you'll occasionally be asked to show how one equation becomes another without putting numbers into it. So you do want to be familiar with the other way as well.